Good evening. I tell you what, if you're here on a Sunday morning, I mean, it's so refreshing in one sense that it's just so quiet and uh, we're not having to take five, ten minutes to get people to come or settle down. You're very welcome. It is good to see you. Thank you uh, for coming. Uh, all of you that are here tonight, very significant day, and we're delighted that you're with us. Uh, let me just point out a few things that are happening this weekend before I say what's going to happen uh, this evening. So tomorrow, uh, for those of you who have younger families, there's an Easter egg hunt. So the first clue will be posted uh, later on and ready for first thing in the morning on the front uh, gates of Model Primary School, which is about 200 yards this way. So you can look at that if you want to do that. It's in the around the Scrabble Estate, so it's not a huge area. Uh, but that'd be something you could do with children. And there's prizes which will be given out then on Sunday morning at the service then. And then tomorrow evening, something for uh, those in their 20s and 30s, young adults ministry. So they're going to have an evening together here uh, with board games and some desserts and what have you. So if you fall into that category, you're welcome tomorrow night at 7. And if you want more information, speak to Johnny Thompson, uh, our youth worker here, and he'll fill you in a wee bit about that as well. And then for the services on Sunday coming, uh, don't forget uh, that tomorrow night the clocks go forward. So just get that sorted out so you get the timings right. And we will get an hour's less rain this weekend on the back of that, which is good. But uh, on Sunday, then, two services. Sunday morning at 11.30, uh, our morning service, our family service. And then Sunday evening, um, very special service for Easter Sunday. Uh, a baptism service. So five people who are going to just stand up here to clear their faith in Jesus Christ, how they became a Christian, why they're being baptized, and then they're going to be baptized on Sunday night. So those things are through the weekend, and you will be invited to any uh, or all of those. We're delighted you're here tonight, and at all three of the services tonight, also uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, John Spears, who is speaking tonight, will be speaking at those. John is an old friend of Scrabble in both senses. Yeah, you know, oh, I mean, you're, John, you're not young, like, to be fair, but... <laughs> But also, he's been a friend for many, many years, and uh, an encouragement and a support to us here in the church. So we're delighted John's with us for the weekend, and we're looking forward to what you're going to share, and more importantly, what God is going to share uh, through you. So tonight's program will just run. I'm going to read something, and then the program will just run through. So it's uh, different songs. If you know the songs, they're corporate, so they'll be sung. If you know them, sing them. If you don't know them, please don't be embarrassed. You can listen. You don't have to sort of feel that you have to try and force yourself to sing if you don't know them. Uh, so just be comfortable tonight um, and enjoy, in one sense, the program, but be open to the fact that God wants to speak to you, that this is a very important message, a very significant day, Easter uh, weekend, Good Friday, and be open to the very God of heaven speaking into your life. And if that's the case, uh, I, I would encourage you to speak to someone about that as well. So come and speak to some of us, John or myself, or some of the people maybe that have invited you along. If you're challenged tonight and you want to find out more, I would encourage you to do that. But the program will run through. John will bring a closing message at the end, and then we'll have refreshments together. That's the plan. Let me just read this. This came into my mind uh, yesterday, just when I was giving some thought to this evening. And some of you will have heard this, but I think it's very pertinent, particularly for uh, today. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. 
He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30 when public opinion turned against him. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. And when he was only 33, his friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only piece of property he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 21 centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. And tonight we focus on him, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Saviour. Thanks, Catherine. It's so great to be able to come here tonight and to lay aside um, our week, lay aside maybe our plans and our thoughts and our thinking, and just to be able to have that real focus on the Lord and on what he's done for us. Um, the first song that we're going to sing talks about the whole of the Easter weekend, from Jesus dying from his death to his glorious resurrection, and then our hope of heaven because of what he's done for us. So let's just turn our minds and cast our minds now to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. Darling, sorry. Uh, if you're parked, folks, see just beside us here, man or mill. If you're parked in the front of that, could you mind slipping out just as we stand to sing this and move your cars? The, the owner is trying to get home, and there's two cars just blocking that. So if you're parked, it's directly left here, man or mill. You need to go and move your car. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, we'll stand and sing after the intro. Oh, praise the name. 
you're just a personal response now you know to what we've sung we've only sung one song and every truth that we know has been in it and because of the love that he has for us we can say and bring a personal thank you and think about what this good friday day actually means to us and then obviously his resurrection and victory
Imagine that first Easter. There are simply not enough words for us to adequately convey all that happened to God's Son as they cruelly led him away. Although no fault in him was found, crucify, they shouted still, as they forced Jesus to carry a wooden cross towards Golgotha's hill. With two guilty criminals on a cross, one hung on either side, in the middle stood his cross, yes, the cross where Jesus would die. The crowd mocked, the people jeered, and yet he still hung there for them. The sky darkened, it looked like it was all over, but that is when Jesus exhaled to utter these three words. It is finished. Yes, it was done, completed. Jesus had fulfilled God's rescue plan. Now forgiveness of sins was available to every child, woman and man. They took Jesus down from his cross, his followers in anguish and gloom, and they buried his lifeless body and rolled a stone over his tomb. But was that really it over? Was that really the end of the story? No, because what happened next would forever rewrite history. You see, early in the morning, just three days later, the most incredible thing, an angel appeared to an unsuspecting woman, her name Mary Magdalene. To her surprise and amazement, the stone had been completely rolled away. Don't be afraid, for he is not here, the angel would boldly say. Heaven erupted to declare these three words. He has risen. Many couldn't believe it. Even the guards made up lies to spread. But the truth was undeniable. Jesus was alive. He had risen from the dead. You see, he appeared to his disciples. And to over 500 people in one go, he had truly triumphed over death, conquered sin, and defeated every foe. And yet, before he ascended to heaven to sit on his rightful throne, he promised to those who would follow him, we would never be alone. And today, he still whispers these three words. I love you. asked what Easter means to me, I immediately thought of three things. And that is that Jesus died on a cross for my sins, that blood was shed, and that he rose three days later. And even though these are things that I learned from a young age, it still today is an ongoing challenge and truth, which has got me through so many ups and downs of life. And even though I fall short so many times during the day, there's even some days where I don't even think of those three things. The day fills up, the day is busy, responsibilities, work, family. And then that's when I realize how undeserving I am and how gracious my God is. I know that Easter has so many things to enjoy. There's the Easter eggs, there's the holidays you're longing to get off. There's the Easter egg hunts where you bring your kids to. And for many people, that's what it is. And then I realize what a joy it is that I know the truth. What a joy it is that I know that Jesus died and there's a resurrection, all for my sins. And with that, it's burdened me to do something more, to share the gospel with others. It's 
give me some sort of fire in my heart to speak as much as I can to others about what I know, about the truth that I know. But also, most importantly, as a mom of two, it's given me the burden that I have to teach my kids the truth, teach my kids the gospel, about the death and resurrection, about that truth, so that hopefully one day, that they will hopefully be saved, and that way they will make that decision to follow Jesus and know him as a saviour. So if you ask me again what Easter means to me, it's that joy, that joy that no matter how undeserving I am, and how sinful I am, that Jesus died for me, and that's some joy that you can't explain. But once you know it, you realize that you can't live without it. Amen. What does Easter mean to me? The work of Jesus done at Easter gives me certainty in my salvation. I was at a kids' camp last weekend, and we were going through the Easter story and the talks, and there was two characters in the story of Easter that really stood out for some reason to the kids. And as we go through the Easter story, we come across two criminals. These criminals are being crucified either side of Jesus. But the difference is, they deserve to be there, he doesn't. And they both have very different responses to Jesus. They both start off mocking him like the crowds around them. But one of them changes his mind. He sees Jesus dying on the cross. And he sees how he's dying. And he figures something out. He says in Luke 23, 41 to 43, We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This man recognized his sinful state before God. He recognized Jesus as Lord. And because of that, he asks Jesus to remember him. And Jesus gives him a certain response and tells him that today he will be with me, with him in paradise. There's no ifs, there's no buts, there's no maybes. Today he will be with him in paradise. In Romans 10, verse 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. asked to just share a wee piece now with you so you can sit back and relax and um, hopefully you can connect with the words in it. I love the refrain at the end of it. It says, you rose, the grave and death are conquered. You broke the bonds of sin and shame. And then there's that personal thanks again. Oh Lord, my rock, my redeemer, may all my ways or may, may all my days bring glory to your name. Oh, Lord, my rock and my 
bring glory to your name. May all my days bring glory to your name. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, 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 sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. Were you there? The theme of my message. In human nature, there is something that draws us to fix our eye and our attention on something that is significant that happens in any part of the world. It may be a bridge collapsing in Baltimore. It may be terrorists going into a concert hall in Moscow. I remember September 11, 2001. I was there. I was in America. And when the news came through of the Twin Towers being blasted and 3,000 lives were lost, we were fixed for hours on the television watching this event. Across the world, there are significant events that draw and catch our attention. In history, the most significant event that ever took place was at Golgotha, Calvary, where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified and nailed to a tree. My question tonight is, and this is, as Glenn said, a special day in the Christian calendar, Good Friday. My question is, were you there? Were you there? I want us briefly to think about three people who in person were there on that occasion. And I'm going to take a moment just to read a couple of verses to identify these three people. I'm reading from John chapter 19, verse 16. It says, Then Pilate, the Roman governor, He turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called He went to the place called the place of the skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And down the verses to verse 25, it says, standing near the cross where Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And so, I'm going to suggest tonight, there were three people who were there and witnessed this event. A soldier, a Roman soldier, he was there. A criminal, as we've already heard from Daniel, he was there as part of that contingent that had to carry out the crucifixion. A soldier, a criminal, 
and a mother. A mother was there. What I want to suggest tonight, that the soldier being there, to him, Jesus and the cross meant nothing. To the criminal, Jesus and the cross meant something. To his mother, Jesus and the cross meant everything. My question is very personal tonight. In which category can you identify yourself with these three different categories? Is it true that Jesus and his cross on this Good Friday to you means nothing? Or because of your background or your influence from parents or family or whatever, you might fall into the category, it means something. But tonight I want to challenge every one of us when we consider the greatness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Does he mean to me and to you everything? Everything. Let's quickly, briefly look at these three categories. The soldier. Part of the Roman justice system was the punishment by crucifixion. One of the most cruelest Methods of putting a man or a woman to death. After the court hearing conducted by Pilate, the Roman procurator, Jesus was pronounced innocent. (laughs) And somehow he was unworthy of death, but Pilate condemned him to die and to death by crucifixion. He handed him over to the Roman soldiers, To carry out the punishment. And when we think of the cruelty and the heartlessness of these soldiers. They mocked Jesus. They attempted to humiliate him. They dressed him like a king. Got a robe. Got a crown. Forced thorns into the shape of a crown. Placed it on his head. Knelt before him in mockery and said, Hail, king of the Jews. Took a reed put it as a scepter in his hand and smote him. And he suffered such injustice. And as we think of the implication of them arriving at the place of execution, there must have been one Roman soldier that drove a nail through the hand of Jesus to pin him to the cross. What did that Roman soldier think of Jesus And this whole issue of the cross and him being crucified, for why? To him, it meant nothing. It was part of his duty as a soldier to carry out the sentence of Pilate. There are millions of people across the world tonight represented by the soldier. Jesus and his cross means nothing. My question is, Allow me, please. Are you one of that group? Do you belong to that group of people represented by the soldier that actually Jesus means nothing to you? May God's Spirit challenge us to think deeply about the personal response to the cross. The criminal, he, of course, thought something about Jesus, Because, as we've already heard read, two malefactors, two thieves, two criminals were being crucified at the same time. One asked for a miracle. One asked for mercy. One said to Jesus, save yourself and us. (laughs) Come down from the cross, do a miracle. He was concerned about himself. The other said, remember me when you come. In your kingdom. This man has done nothing amiss. We deserve to die, but he doesn't. Jesus responded to this 11th hour cry from a man who was unworthy, a sinner of the deepest dye. You may ask me tonight, a uh, personal level, do you believe in 11th hour conversion? 
I would say, yes, I do. For recently, I sat in Hare Myers Hospital in Scotland beside a man and a friend whose wife has been a Christian for many years and he has never become a Christian. And he asked his wife if I would come to see him. I said, Scott, what's on your mind? He says, I want, I want to get saved. He had been advised by the doctors he had only a few days to live. And sitting by his bedside, I explained to him the simplicity of the gospel, that as a sinner, God loves you, Christ died for you, and rose again. And if you're willing to confess him with your lips and with your heart, believing that he is the Son of God, then you will have the promise of heaven as your eternal hope. There is a very eminent... uh, Scottish preacher called Alistair Begg. You may see or hear him on YouTube. But I heard them tell this story about the dying thief. He said, this criminal at the last hour appealed to Jesus for mercy. And he got to heaven's gates. And Peter said to him, why should you get in? Can I ask you a few questions? Yes. Were you a follower of Jesus? No, he said, I was. Were you a church member? No, I was. Were you baptized? No, I was. Did you lead a good life? No, he said, I didn't. Then why should I let you in? And the thief on the cross said, because the man on the center cross told me there's a place for me in heaven. Let me reassure every person tonight in this building that we have no right to get to heaven apart from the grace of God and the salvation of Christ through his cross. And if we're willing to repent and confess our our sin and our need, then God, in his marvelous love and grace, will save you and give you a place in heaven. Thirdly, who was there? It's a very moving part of the story of the cross. Jesus' mother was there. To her, Jesus meant everything. He had, she had borne him in a stable. 33 years previously, she well remembered the moment, I'm sure, of his birth. She had watched him grow up through his teenage years into his adulthood. She had watched him perform his first miracle, turning water into wine to meet and satisfy the embarrassment of the host at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus recognized that he was the son of God. She believed in him. She loved him. And she was willing to go public with her love and her faith and stand at the cross, openly exposed to all who pass by. She was a follower and a believer in Jesus. It's very interesting. I was sitting in the plane beside a lady coming over here uh, on a visit, and, and through conversation, I was able to say, could I ask you, are you a believer in Jesus? How important it is to be able to declare your personal faith in Jesus. But let me also say tonight, as I close this little message, there is a cost involved at being a follower of Jesus. Don't let's <laughs> preach easy believism. Let us preach what Jesus did, the true cost of following him. If any man come after me and deny himself and take up his cross, in 1685, in our history in Scotland, 
It was a very, very turbulent time for those who press, profess faith in Christ. The days were defined as the days of the covenanters. There were four ladies attended what was called a conventicle. It was a field meeting to declare their faith in Jesus. They were arrested by the police for it was against the law. They were brought to court. The judge, Grierson of Lag, down in South Scotland, White Town. He addressed the four of them. The oldest lady, Margaret McLachlan, he said, at 70 years of age, you will die unless you recant in the Solway Pit. And he went through each of them. Margaret Maxwell, he said, you will be whipped publicly in the town of Wigton that people will see the error of what you have done. To the young girl at 13 years of age, one of the Wilson sisters, he said, your father will be fined, a very severe fine. Then he turned to the fourth girl. Margaret Wilson, 18, how many young people are here tonight, 18 years of age? Raise your hand. Let me see the 18-year-olds. Oh, they're too shy to do that. I know that. Young people today are different. 18 years of age. He said, the judge said, you also will die in the Solway Fair unless you change your mind and recant. She said, I'll never change my mind. I'm willing to die for Jesus. And as they led her out to witness Margaret McLachlan first being drowned when the tide came in, and then they let it go back out, and then they took Margaret Wilson and tied her hands behind her back to a stake in the sand so that the tide might come in and drown her. And she died quoting the words of Psalm 25. She was willing to pay the cost. On this very special day in the Christian calendar, Good Friday, as we consider seriously the story of Christianity, the factual details of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, coming from heaven to live and to die, and the purpose and reason for his death was to take God's Punishment and anger against sin that should be meted to you and me. He took our place. Can I ask you tonight, friend, in your mind and in your heart, transport yourself to Calvary. Which person there from our story tonight represents you? The soldier who Jesus and his cross means nothing? Or the criminal? And somehow you're thinking about it. You may have a past where you once believed and you've walked away from your faith. But it means something tonight to be in this service. Or can I ask everyone tonight, as passionately as I can, when you realize the sacrifice that Christ has made on the cross for you and for me, are you saying, Lord Jesus, I want to give you everything in my life? May God help us. It's a great thrill and a joy for me to come back to Scrabble. I've been coming here for a few years in the old hall. And I've had wonderful experiences of preaching and helping people uh, take that final step to trust Jesus Christ as the Savior. And in the little hall, in the little room in the old hall with Stanley Prater, the night he got saved. And so this is a special place for me to come to. And if you are concerned about your soul and your salvation and you're not a Christian and you know in your heart you need to be saved or you need to come back to the Lord, don't rush away. Take time to talk to me, or to talk to one of the friends here that you know and make it clear. Because I understand there's some refreshments and a cup of tea, and so there's no rush away. Could I also just add a personal note tonight? It is a special day for me. This is my wife's birthday. She's 81 today. 
You can see I'm a lot younger than her. <laughs> I won't be 81 until September. <laughs> but this is a special day. Because there was a day in Kathy's life and in my life when we were born again. The 2nd of January 1956. I accepted Christ as my Savior. Can I ask you young people particularly, has there been a moment when you've invited Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Oh, may God help us and bless us. As Glenn intimated, um, I'll be back with the church here on Sunday morning to open the little worship meeting that we have and then to participate in the family service. And I will be back at night for a very special service. I understand five people will go public with their faith in Jesus and be baptized in this tank that's below my feet. Could I challenge the members of the church here to think seriously, who could I invite to come and witness a baptism? Or who could I encourage to come along to the family service? Someone who's not a Christian and who needs to be saved. May God help us. As our dear young friend, I think a young friend who spoke for Sarah said, the challenge is to share the news with others. We get so lazy as Christians to be content with our own salvation without reaching out to those who need it. So please bear with that appeal for the Sunday services. Let's take a moment to pray. Our Father, we do thank you for the privilege and the honor of preaching the message of the gospel tonight here in Scrabble Hall. We thank you for the music. We thank you for the songs. Thank you for the beautiful song, I cast my mind to Calvary. May our minds, as well as our hearts, focus on the factual details of Calvary and what it meant to Jesus and what it means to us. So bless your word and cause that the Holy Spirit may convict and trouble someone about their need to be saved. And may they have the courage as Margaret Wilson had, to take the action that's required. Bless our refreshments. Bless our conversation together with one another. And remember those in the world tonight whose world is a world of suffering. In Gaza, in Sudan, around the world where people have endured the suffering of sin. We pray for others tonight, as well as ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your very good attention. And uh, there's no final hymn. And uh, you can chat to your friends or neighbors. And as I said, I'll be in the foyer. I would love that you might feel free to come and talk to me. And, uh, and then tea uh, and coffee will be served at the hatch. So don't rush away. Thank you for being with us. And may God bless you as you go home. Thank you. <laughs>